Hi there, welcome back to the Veterinary Online Review course. Uh, we're continuing on with Anatomy and Physiology. We're in 2.6, the Endocrine, Reproductive, and Nervous System. This lecture will be on the reproductive system. So the reproductive system does not interact with any other body system except, um, physically I'm talking about, except for the urethra in males. It does share with the urinary system. Um, the reproductive system is not essential to the life of the animal, hence why we can spay and neuter them. And the only function for the reproductive system is to just reproduce. That's it. So the male reproductive system, let's start with that. This, these are really great pictures. To the left here, you're seeing a canine male reproductive system. And then to the right, you're seeing a feline reproductive system, male fe feline. So the function is to produce the male sex hormone, uh, typically testosterone, and uh, to, de to develop spermatozoa. Another word for spermatozoa is sperm, which is the little swimmers and delivers the sperm to the female system at the appropriate time during copulation. So um, we're gonna go through the different organs um, associated with the reproductive system. We're gonna start with the testes. So it's the male gonad, just like the female gonad is the ovaries. The testes are the male gonad. They are the ones responsible for producing the sperm. So the production of sperm is called spermatogenesis. And also responsible, the testes are for producing hormones, which is the androgens, which is the male sex hormones. Um, it's located outside the abdomen in the inguinal region, and the inguinal region is just another term for the groin region, and the testes are housed in a sack of skin, which is called the scrotum. So the scrotum is the skin that holds the testicles or the testes. So how does the develop how does the testes develop okay in these young animals? So before birth, so in utero, they start developing in the abdomen. And they actually start developing up towards the kidneys. And they're actually still connected um, to the scrotum by a band of connective tissue called the um, guber gubernaculum. Sorry, it's a silly word, eh? And uh, so the testes gradually are pulled caudally and ventrally in utero as the fetus grows. So it's still connected. Um, so in utero, they start developing up by the kidney, but they're connected in the scrotal sac by this gubernaculum, which is just a string of tissue. And so as the animal grows, um, that testicle will be pulled more and more down towards the scrotal sac. Okay, so soon after birth, the testes are pulled down through the inguinal ring. And to the right here, you can see the inguinal ring. So in the inguinal region, in the groin region, there's going to be an opening in that muscle that's going to allow the testicle to drop down. And um, the inguinal rings, it, um, it will pass through that and the scrotum will then be there. And that's where after birth, um, the testes will start and continue growing. So the scrotum itself is the sac of skin that house the, houses the testicles. They help regulate temperature of the testes. So the testes must be kept slightly cooler than the actual internal body temperature. And that is so that they can make sperm. And that's why they have to stay cooler. There is something called the cremaster muscle, which passes down through the inguinal ring and attaches to the scrotum. And what this does, it actually adjusts the position of the testes relative to the body, depending on the temperature. So um, if the internal body of the dog is really warm and really hot, the cremaster muscle is going to let, um, is going to relax and let that scrotal sac um, droop down a little bit lower. So that's basically, it's um, going to get the testicles away from that hot and internal body temperature so that we can keep those testicles cool. If, for example, the dog gets cold, that cremaster muscle will tighten up and actually bring that scrotal sac up closer to the body, hoping, um, and its goal is to um, keep those testicles warm as possible. The spermatic cord. So the spermatic cord links the testicles to the rest of the body. So that's how it's attached. It's a tube-like connective tissue and in that cord, it has blood vessels, nerves, lymphatic vessels, and also the vas deferens, which we're going to talk about in a second what that is. So there is also something called a 
pampiniform plexus, which you can see down there in that picture. And it's a structure or meshwork of veins that surround the testicular artery. And this maintains testes at a temperature slightly lower than the body temperature and also warms the blood back to body temperatures before it returns up to the abdomen because we can't have that colder blood returning to our systemic circulation because that will become hypothermic, right? So thanks to this um, structure and meshwork, we can make that happen. So there is something called a tunic, and this is just a connective tissue that envelops the testy. So in this picture, you see that they made an incision through the um, skin, and then they're pushing out the testicle, but they also have to cut through this sheet, this sheath-like layer around the testicle, and that's called the tunic. Okay, so going deeper into the to the testes, there are um, seminiferous tubules. So this is where spermatogenesis happens. They are long U-shaped tubes attached at both ends to a complex system of ducts. Um, and those ducts are actually called the red testes. And you can see in this picture there, it'll show you the um, seminiferous tubules there. Now between these tubules, there is interstitial cells, okay? So in between those tissues, there's cells. We talked about this in the endocrine system, and these are actual endocrine cells in between these tubules, and they produce androgens, so the male sex hormone, which is primarily testosterone, and, um, and these hormones are influenced by the luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary gland. We just talked about that in the adrenal um, lecture. Now the duct system, um, once the spermatozoa are formed in the seminiferous tubules, they enter the red A testis. I, I'm, please excuse my pronunciation if that's not correct. Um, so you can see it up in this picture. They start, the spermatogenesis happens down here in the seminiferous tubules and they'll make their way up to the redis testis, redi testis, and then flow through the efferent ducts of the testes and they'll make their way up to the epididymis, which is all right here. It kind of hugs the cranial surface of the testy there. And that's where the spermatozoa is stored until ejaculation. Um, the epididymis is a single long convoluted tube that connects the afferent ducts of the testes uh, with the vas deferens. And the vas deferens is also called the ductus deferens, like in this picture up here. And that's the exit. So upon ejaculation, the spermatozoa is going to come out of the epididymis and up the ductus deferens or the vas deferens, whichever one you want to call it. And um, so in the epididymis, that's where they're stored and maturation will happen with those guys too. This is a wonderful picture of an excised testicle, and that arrow is pointing at the epididymis, epididymis which is uh, clearly visible on the cranial aspect of that testy. So the epididymis is the head region, so this is the site where spermatozoa um, enter from the afferent ducts, like we said. It has a body region, which lies along the surface of the testy, and then there's a tail region, which continues on as the vas deferens. So, um, so that tail region will be then, uh, will develop into the ductus deferens, or the vas deferens, whatever you want, you want to call it. Now the vas deferens, which is the exit. Okay, that's where once this once upon ejaculation, that's where the sperm will travel. So also called the ductus deferens, which is um, and it becomes a part of the spermatic cord. Remember that cord is what connects the testicle to the body, and that cord contains different things like blood vessels and nerves, and also the vas deferens. <coughs> so. The vas deferens is actually, because remember the testicles in the scrotal sac, so the vas deferens is going to lead its way up through the inguinal ring that we were talking about, and then separates from the spermatic cord and then connects with the urethra. Um, it has a thick, smooth muscle wall, and its function is to propel sperm quickly from the epididymis to the urethra at the time of ejaculation. Now, the urethra, this has to be talked about because the urethra becomes part of the reproductive system in males. So it does have two functions. It carries urine from the urinary bladder out, so it has urinary function, but also has reproductive function where that it, um, it's responsible also for ejaculation. So urine flow will temporarily be blocked when ejaculation occurs. So spermatozoa from the vas deferens and secretions from the accessory reproductive glands, which we, we're going to talk about in a second, um, enter the urethra and are pumped out as semen. 
So the accessory reproductive glands. The sperm make up a small portion of the semen, actually. The majority of it is made up of secretions from various accessory sex glands. So there's ducts of all these accessory uh, reproductive glands that enter the pelvic portion of the urethra. So that's where it's going to meet the spermatozoa. And um, different species have different combination of accessory re reproductive glands. So that's where it gets confusing because some species will have certain where others won't have them at all. Um, these, this, um, this secretion from these re accessory reproductive glands produce an alkaline fluid. So it's made up of electrolytes, fructose, and pros prostaglandins. And they help counteract the acidity of the female reproductive tract. So the female reproductive tract is more acidic, um, but thanks to the fluid um, produced by the accessory reproductive glands, um, it's alkaline and it'll help neutralize that. So the fructose in this solution uh, provides an energy source for the sperm. And then there's also prostaglandins within the, the fluid and this stimulates cervical contractions in female to help move the sperm up actually. Um, and this is a weird and strange fact. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you guys in human medicine have heard have w of women trying to induce labor. And one way to do that is medical professionals um, recommend sexual activity, so copulation, to help induce labor. And this this is why, as in, I, I find this super interesting, the prostaglandins that are actually in that semen will stimulate cervical contractions, hence why it will hopefully help induce labor. And so labor contractions is your cervix contracting. So the prostaglandins in the semen is what may help stimulate that cervical contraction. So that's how it helps. Anyways, interesting fact. <laughs> So the accessory reproductive glands that we're talking about, um, one of them is the prostate gland. And the prostate gland actually surrounds the urethra. There's multiple ducts that carry the secretions into the urethra. So um, we talked about this during the urinary system, but the, the prostate gland lies right there, right when the where the bladder exits out. So you can appreciate when you have prostatitis how this can affect urine output because it's just going to pinch off that urethra. So you can see that there, the prostate gland and the urethra. So when this is inflamed, you can imagine um, how easy it is going to affect the urine output. So this is a really cool picture of um, a prostate gland, okay? And um, you can see, again, its correlation with the urinary system and how it may affect it when it is enlarged, like in this case here. And you can actually see that the enlarged prostate is actually pushing up on the on the bowel, which is up here. And um, so when when veterinary veterinarians do and check check for the prostate, they do rectal exams. So they will pass their fingers in there, and you can see why they do that because they can palpate the prostate, which lies right underneath that bowel there. And this is the rectum, the exit. So it's it's very close to that. So with prostatitis, you can put your fingers in there and palpate an enlarged prostate. So another accessory reproductive gland is the bulbourethral gland. Um, it's also known as the Cowper's gland. And there's ducts that enter the urethra near the caudal border of the pelvis. Um, it secretes mucinous fluid just before ejaculation that clears and lubricates the urethra. So it gets it ready. Now, the bulbal urethral gland is present in cats, humans, and cattle, but not dogs. So dogs do not have this accessory sex gland. This is a very creepy picture of the um, bulbo urethral gland in, um, in a male. This, this picture is crazy. You can see this is the urinary bladder here. And these are the two ureters. And it's kind of interesting. You, I always think that the ureters come up here cranially onto the bladder, but they really don't. They, the ureters come from the kidneys way up here in the abdominal cavity and make their way to the bottom of the bladder. And then it fills that way. And then it'll be excreted this way, down here through the urethra out the penis, which is right here. So 
Um, the penis itself is composed of muscle, erectile tissue, and connective tissue. There's large blood supply and many sensory nerve endings. There's three main parts of the penis. There's the root of the penis, the body of the penis, and the glands of the penis. And the glands of the penis actually um, is the tip of the penis. So the root of the penis is a band of connective tissue and they attach the penis to the brim of the pelvis. The body of the penis is bundles of um, erectile tissue, so it's fibrous connective tissue specifically, and, um, and there's also blood-filled sinuses. So when the sinuses engorge with blood, um, inelastic connective tissue around the sinuses generate hydraulics, which will cause the erection. The glands of the penis is the distal end or the tip. Okay, so it has very, it has numerous sensor, sensory nerves. Um, and then the prepuce is the sheet of skin that encloses the penis when it is not erect. So this down here is a picture of a, of a feline penis. And when you let that penis go back in, it will go in um, and in the prepuce is all that you'll be able to see. Now, um, there's something really different with the canine penis, and they actually have an os penis. So this is a bone in the penis. Um, the urethra runs through the groove of the ventral surface, surface of this bone. Um, there's something called the bulb of the glands, which enlargement towards the rear of the glands. So remember the, the, the glands is the tip of the penis, and there's a bulb that actually is just right behind that glands. It engorges with blood and reaches full size after ejaculation, remains clamped in place by contractions of muscles surrounding the vagina and vulva. So this is what causes them to attach themselves after copulation. Erection of the bulb subsides in about 15 to 20 minutes. So that's how long you have to wait for um, a canine, uh, for the male and the female canine to detach after copulation. And it's because of the um, engorgement of the bulb of the glands. There's something called the sigmoid flexure. So the S, it's, it's only in bulls, rams, and boars, and it's actually an S shape of the non erect penis. The higher portion of the connective tissue to erectile tissue, sorry, it has a higher portion of connective tissue to erectile tissue than other species. The erection results from straightening of the sigmoid flexure from the internal hydraulic pressure that we talked about and causes the penis to protrude from the prepuce for breeding. This is a picture of um, the sigmoid flexure. So you can see the sigmoid flexure there has the S shape. And then the glands of the penis, which is towards the right there, which is, um, which is the very tip. So the reproductive function, uh, function, so erection results from a parasympathetic reflex triggered by sexual stimulation. So often it involves olfactory cues and behavioral changes. So it's not, um, it's not just um, touch and sensation. It also can be olfactory and behavioral. So arteries dilate and increase flow to the penis. The veins are compressed against the brim of the penis through the contraction of the muscle in the root of the penis, and that's how that happens. Now, ejaculation um, is a reflex expulsion of semen, okay? So that means that the spermatozoa makes its way from the testes out um, thanks to the propulsion and the um, lubrication from the accessory sex glands. So semen moves from the accessory reproductive gland into the pelvic portion of the urethra where it'll meet the sperm and rhythmic contractions of the urethra pump the semen out into the female's reproductive tract. And uh, this picture over here is just to show you the difference between bull semen and canine semen. So definitely um, a difference not only in the amount, but also in the um, color as well. So let's talk, now that we know anatomically um, the reproductive tract and system, let's talk about spermatogenesis, so the formation of sperm. So this is the production of the male sex cell, which is sperm, and occurs in the seminiferous tubules, which we said, and between the tubules, we know this, we've talked about it several times, The uh, between these tubules, there's interstitial cells that produce the androgens, and um, the sperm are actually produced continuously in a very large number, hence why they need the epididymis for storage. 
So there's a primary spermatocyte, and um, this d divides by meiosis into secondary spermatocytes, which you can see on this picture here. After that, the secondary spermatocytes then divide by mitosis into four spermatids, which you can again see here, which will then eventually develop into the little swimmer. So spermatids grow tails and then undergo other physical changes that convert them into the actual little sperm swimmer. And this is a picture here just showing you the primary spermatocyte, the secondary spermatocyte going under mitosis, dividing again where it's going to develop little tails and form into the sperm. So um, over to the right of this picture, this is a very interesting um, diagram. So it's this is the primary spermatocyte which we were talking about. It divides, it divides, and then it then will form tails and form into these little swimmers here. So when the sperm, sper sperm are fully developed, they detach and are carried to the epididymis for storage. This is an interesting picture showing you the differences of the epididymis in different species. So let's move on to the female reproductive system. So it's made up of ligaments, um, then there's two ovaries, oviducts, uterus, cervix, vagina, and vulva. So let's talk about those. So the ligaments, the ovaries, oviduct, and uterus all hang by, a sh by sheets of peritoneum from the dorsal part of the abdominal cavity. Remember the peritoneum is that layer of connective tissue that hugs inside the abdominal cavity, that lines the uh, abdominal cavity. So there's sheets of these uh, that, are, that make up the ligaments that are holding the ovaries, the oviduct, and the uterus. These sheets are called of the peritoneum are called the broad ligaments, which you can see here in this picture, and they contain blood vessels and nerves. So this is all holding the uterus and, um, and the ovaries and all that in place. So during a spay, we actually have to detach these so that we can excise those parts. There's a suspensory ligament uh, for the ovary. The ovarian end of the broad ligament is attached to the body wall near the last rib, so that has to be detached during a spay, and you can see the suspensory ligament in this picture. There's also a round ligament of the uterus, so this is fibrous tissue and smooth muscle in the lateral fold of the broad ligament on each side, which also would need to be detached during a spay. The ovaries are located in the dorsal abdomen near the kidneys, so they're quite back there because we, we talked about the kidneys and where they're located. Um, there are species variation in appearance, and this is the site for oogenesis, so the formation of eggs, and um, this is also the site of production of estrogen and progestin. So as far as the ovarian cycle, so how these ovaries will produce an egg, um, one cycle is the development of an ovum, ovulation, the, for, the formation of the corpus luteum, and then the degeneration or unripening or unripened follicle and corpus luteum. So that is one whole entire cycle. Okay, so the ovary is going to make a follicle, the egg's going to burst out, there's going to be a CL formation, and then it, that's going to degenerate, and that is one entire ovarian cycle. So it's influenced by the follicle-stimulating hormone, the FSH, from the pituitary gland, and also the luteinizing hormone from the pituitary gland. Um, there's different types of species that undergo different ovarian cycles. There's uniparous species, which is one mature ovum is produced per cycle. So horses, cows, and humans, we per ovarian cycle, we produce one egg. So the typical birth will give us one offspring. There are multiparous species where multiple ovas are produced per cycle, like cats, dogs, and sows. And these guys will give birth to litters because there was multiple ova. Um, so when we're talking about the ovarian cycle, um, where it starts out, it starts out as the primordial follicle or a primary follicle. So this is the immature oocyte. So an oocyte will turn into an egg eventually through this cycle. So it's an immature oocyte surrounded by a single layer of follicular cells. 
Then there's follicular activation. So follicle growth is triggered thanks to the FSH from the pituitary gland, remember. So the, follic the follicular cells thicken and multiply into multiple layers, uh, which will then turn into granulosa cells. These, uh, the follicle grows rapidly as the granulosa cells multiply. And that's how the follicle is formed on the ovary. The granulosa cells produce increasing amounts of estrogen as the follicle becomes larger. Um, fluid filled spaces form between the granulosa cells and the spaces gradually merge into one large fluid filled space, which is called the antrum and the mature follicle. Um, it is when um, the production of estrogen will peak. Okay. And then remember with the um, endocrine system, with this peak of estrogen, the FSH is going to stop and LH is going to start. Okay. So the oocyte on the top of the granulosa cell mound uh, surrounded by a thin layer of granulosa cells. So again, this is just showing you um, the cycle of um, the ovulation. So it's starting out here. This uh, little white area is going to be the egg and then um, it will reach estrogen uh, maximums here, which will then talk to the pituitary Terry gland saying stop with the FSH let's give us some LH and then the follicle will rupture out and it will turn into a corpus luteum and then degenerate. So the rupture of the mature follicle and release of the reproductive cell into the oviduct okay that's ovulation. The surface of the mature follicle weakens and ruptures so fluid re released from the antrum uh, from the follicle uh, with the ovum. Um, the empty follicle fills with blood and turns into a corpus hemorrhagicum. So again, this is just showing you ovulation. And um, I like this picture because it shows you that the um, fallopian tubes, if you will, are not directly, or the oviducts are not directly connected with the ovary. They, there's actually a space here that it travels. And so you can see the ovum being released here and traveling to the oviduct. So ovulation occurs spontaneously in most species as a result of rising levels of the LH. So our estrogen is going to peak and then it's going to tell our pituitary gland to stop producing FSH. It's going to start producing LH and then spontaneously ovulation will happen. But there is something called induced ovulators. So this is ovulation occurs after breeding. So it has nothing to do with the LH to make that ovulation happen. It actually is just the act of copulation that is going to do that. So cats, rabbits, and ferrets are induced ovulators. So the second copulation happens, they can ovulate and get pregnant. And that's why they're much more successful with pregnancies. Now, after the follicle ruptures and releases the egg, corpus luteum will form, um, uh, influenced by the continued stimulation of the luteinizing hormone. It does produce progestins, which is, the, is, which is a group of hormones which is primarily progesterone, and it's necessary for the maintenance of pregnancy. So endocrine signals to ovary causes the corpus luteum to be maintained if the ovum implants in the uterus. So that progesterone will constantly be made, um, which will maintain the pregnancy and uh, stop ovulation from happening again. This here is a wonderful picture. Um, we can see the follicles, which are A and B, and um, then the corpus luteum body or the CL body, which is um, C. That's what an ovary looks like. Now the oviducts or the fallopian tubes, which is more commonly used in um, human medicine, or it can be called the uterine tubes. They extend from the tip of the uterine horns. Um, it's smooth muscle fi it has smooth muscle fiber walls. It has a ciliated cell in the lining of it, which will help bring that ova down. The muscle contractions and cilia movement guide the ovum towards the uterus. And the oviducts is actually the site of fertilization. So the sperm have to make their way all the way up to the fallopian tube to fertilize that egg if they want successful impregnation. This here is showing you a picture of the oviduct. And again, it's not directly connected to the egg or to the ovary. It, there is going to be a gap there. So after that, we have the uterus. 
Now, the uterus is a hollow muscular organ. It's usually Y-shaped. The uterine body forms the base of the Y, and the uterine horns will form the arms of the Y. This here is showing you um, the uh, uterus here. So this is a dog uterus, and you can see the uterine body depicted in pink and the two uterine horns depicted in the light blue and the dark blue showing you each ovary at the tip. Now, the uterus varies between species. So you can see different species um, and their variation here. The first picture being rat, mouse, and rabbit. Second one being gerbils. Uh, the third top one being the pig. Going down to the mare, which is quite different. And then going to cat, dogs, and ewes. And then we have primates, which is the last bottom one there, which is totally different from all the others. Similar to a horse, actually. So the uterus, um, the uterine wall layers, there is an endometrium, which um, lining composed of simple columnar epithelial and simple tubular glands, and these secrete mucus and other su uh, substances. Then there's a myometrium, myo means muscle, right? So it's the thick layer of smooth muscle. And then we have the perimetrium, which is the outermost layer covered by visceral layer of the peritoneum actually. And that moves down to the cervix, which is a smooth muscle sphincter between the body of the uterus and then the vagina. So they have the uterus on the upper part of the cervix and then up here. And then you have our cervix here and then underneath that is the vagina. This controls access to the lumen of the uterus from the vagina. So um, it will control the access of the sperm, for example, to make its way up. It's usually tightly closed, except for during estrus and parturition. Now, moving down the reproductive tract past the cervix, we have the vagina, which is a muscular tube, which extends caudally from the cervix and connects with the vulva. And then the vulva, which is composed of the vestibule, the clitoris, and the labia. So it is the, um, it's the external opening. And the urethra opens on the floor of the vestibule, actually. So estrus cycles can be a little bit challenging to wrap your head around, um, so there is a link there. There's different types of estrus cycles. There's polyestrous animals, uh, and these guys cycle continuously throughout the year if they're not pregnant. For example, cattle and swine. There are seasonally polyestrous animals, and these guys um, have seasonal variations in their estrus cycles, like horses, sheep, and cats. Ever notice that cats will start going into heat in the spring and start having babies around that time, and that's because they're seasonally polyesterous. Um, there is uh, animals that are diesterous, which have two cycles a year, um, usually spring and fall, but again, that varies, and that's usually your dog. And then monoesterous animals that cycle once a year, like foxes and mink. So the thing with diesterous, we, we said that dogs are diesterous and usually um, go have one cycle twice a year, but there is going to be a variation. So you can see in, these, in this smaller dog here, um, we're going to have three to four months between the heat cycles, except for in this large guy here, which between um, there, there may be 12 to 18 months between, between her heat cycles. So the estrus cycle, it's time from the beginning of one heat period um, so estrus to the next, so one estrus to the next. It starts at around 6 to 18 months of age, typically, and there's different stages of the estrus cycle. There's proestrus, uh, estrus, metaestrus, diestrus, and anestrus. Now, there are some documentations that will um, integrate metaestrus with diestrus, and they happen to be the same stage, but we're going to separate it. So estrus cycle of the female dog, we have proestrus at the top and then estrus, diestrus, anestrus. So again, the diestrus and metaestrus is put together here in just one diestrus, and then it'll restart all over again. Proestrus, the first stage of estrus, the follicle begins developing and growing. The output of estrogen increases, right? Because we have that growing follicle. The lining of the oviduct, uterus, and vagina thicken. The vagina epithelium begins to cornify and form layers of keratin on its surface, so that will change the cellular um, aspect when we're looking at vaginal cytology. Bloody vaginal discharge in some species, 
animals getting ready for breeding. So that's what's happening in proestrus. The female will not allow mounting of the male at this stage. She's just getting ready. And this stage will last about 40 to 20 days in dogs. So this is vaginal cytology for the proestrous stage. So a gradual shift from intermediate and parabasal cells to superficial cells. So um, typically red blood cells are going to be present, especially in, in, in the breeds of animals um, that um, bleed during this stage. And you may see some neutrophils as well and maybe some bacteria. So what is a parabasal cell? We talked about it on the last slide. Let's talk about what that is. So the parabasal cells are the smallest epithelial cells seen on a typical vaginal smear. So it's always in the vaginal lining. They're round or nearly round and have a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So that means they have a high NC ratio. Um, they're prevalent on smears taken during diestrus and anestrus, but they're not common during early proestrus, and they're completely absent during estrus. So these parabasal cells that you see down here will be a good indicator of what stage of estrus the animal's in. This is um, a comparison of the vulva of an anestrous female and a proestrous female. So quite a difference in the vulva. So when we do see the enlargement of the vulva, we can be sure that they're at the beginning stages, so proestrous stage of their heat cycle. Now they go into, after proestrous, they go into estrus. This is the period of sexual receptivity in the female. So the female will allow the male to mount at this point. Estrogen level, um, level production peaks, therefore ovulation occurs in some species at this stage. Induced ovulator species like cats and rabbits remain in a prolonged state of estrus, if not bred. Now, what's tricky with these cats and why they're such good breeders is that so they can remain in a prolonged state of estrus, which means they're ready for the, that egg is ready to get impregnated. And they're also induced ovulators, right? So upon copulation, the egg's going to come out and they're going to be able to have babies. So they can stay in a prolonged state of estrus, which makes them really good breeders. And this stage typically lasts 5 to 13 days in dogs. And uh, this is a picture um, to the uneducated eye. It may mean absolutely nothing except for a dog smelling another dog's butt. But we have to look at this in a different way. And this is a female that is in estrus. And the way that we know that she's in estrus is that she's sexually receptive. And the way that we know that is that she's standing and allowing this male to smell her. And also she's moving her tail to the side, which means that she is receptive to mounting. So this means she's an estrus. Vaginal cytology of estrus is predominantly cornified um, epithelial cells. So we don't see those basal cells anymore, but we do have the cornified epithelial cells and that's gonna tell us that she's an estrus. And then metastress. So this is the period during which the corpus luteum develops. So now our follicle has ruptured, we've ovulated, now our corpus luteum is starting to develop. Progesterone produced by the corpus luteum temporarily inhibits follicular development in the ovary. So um, when the corpus luteum is just freshly made and it's it'll start producing progesterone and this will inhibit another follicle from being able to come about. The lining of the uterus is prepared for implantation of the fertilized ovum if it is fertilized. The cornified epithelial lining that developed in the vagina during proestrus and estrus is now gone. So you're not gonna see those cornified cells anymore. And now metastrus lasts about 60 to 90 days in dogs. And this is the vaginal cytology of the metastrus. Now diastrus, which often is clumped with metastrus, the corpus luteum is at its maximum size and exerting maximum effect. If a fertilized ovum implants, the corpus luteum is retained um, well into the pregnancy. And if no pregnancy occurs, then the CL body degenerates and that's the end of diastrus, okay? So the animal then either goes back into proestrus It'll start ovulating all over again, depending on what kind of um, ovulator it is, or the ovary shuts down and the animal will go into anestrus.
This is the vaginal cytology of diesterous marked by a decline in the numbers of cornified cells. Um, remember, we talked about once the CL body is made, the cornified cells will disappear and um, all of a sudden the parabasal cells will be back. There they are there, those nice round high NC ratio cells. And then there's anesterous, which is the period of temporary ovarian inactivity. So it's seen in seasonal polyesterous, diesterous, and monoesterous animals. So those are the ones that will only ovulate or go through one cycle so many times um, at or at certain times. And ovary temporarily shuts down. And this lasts about two to three months in dogs. V vaginal cytology of anesterous. The cornified cells are absent. You don't see those. Those are typically only present during estrus. And um, you can see those parabasal cells again. And neutrophils may also be present or absent. So now, um, after all of that, let's talk about oogenesis. So the, this is the production of the female sex cell, which is the ova. And it occurs in the ovarian follicle, which we talked about. The female has a fi fixed number of primary oocytes at or soon after birth. So that means that they're in, when a female is born, she has a certain amount of eggs that's already predetermined. Now I say eggs, but those are actually oocytes. They're just little cells that will eventually form into an egg once the ovulation um, happens, but there's a fixed amount, there's a fixed number. Now oogenesis produces a small number of ova at a time. Um, oogenesis, uh, primary oocyte, divides by meiosis into a larger secondary oocyte and a smaller polar body. Um, polar bodies are just like garbage cans for extra chromosomes, and um, they'll never develop into the ova. They're just kind of, um, they take care of extra chromosomes. So you can see in this picture here, the polar bodies, and then that one will develop into the egg. So the secondary oocyte and the first polar body divide and then mitosis and then the ovum is created as well as three polar bodies, which are just garbage cans. And, uh, and that's how one egg is produced, much different than the spermatogenesis that produces a large amount of sperm uh, during this process. The oogenesis just produces one. So again, spermatogenesis versus oogenesis. So the top, you can see the division and the splitting of the male sex cell, um, dividing down and creating a whole bunch of sperm. Whereas on the bottom, you can see that the um, female sex cell will then divide, but create only one egg. 